we have a treat for you on Let Me Be Frank today. We are opening up the listener mailbag and Bishop Cangiano is going to answer your questions. So keep your radio here at 1350 AM or 103.9 FM or keep us on your phone with the Veritas mobile app, which is available at your phone's app store or on veritascatholic.com. And if you're listening to Let Me Be Frank on podcast, please be sure to rate us, review us, give us five stars and help us reach more souls. And thank you, thank you, thank you to our sponsor, Foundations in Faith. Foundations in Faith embraces innovative approaches to funding pastoral care programs in the Diocese of Bridgeport. Resources focus on energizing lifelong faith formation and discipleship and fostering a commitment to justice and accompaniment with our most vulnerable. From seminarians to retired priests, from baptism to last rites, from suburbs to inner cities, the reach is broad and the impact is meaningful. For more information, visit them on the web at foundationsinfaith.org. Okay, here we go. This is Let Me Be Frank on the Veritas Catholic Network. I'm Steve Lee, and it is my great pleasure as always to introduce Bishop Frank Caggiano. Steve, we're going to do one of my favorite things, which is answer listener questions. This is so much fun and informative. Yeah, Yeah, I love it. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, and it's great because the more we do it, the more listeners write in and uh it's just mm-hmm. it's just fantastic mm-hmm. this is actually mm-hmm. one of the uh, one of the 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 goals of the show from the beginning was to get interaction for you with the people of the diocese so. exactly 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 yep okay so Good. i guess with that said let's get right to the listener questions mm-hmm. okay question number one did you ever have an altar boy or girl who later went on to become a priest or nun um, not to my knowledge, but I'm praying that there are, there are some out there right, who did, but I told you, I think I may have told you the story, but, um, there was an altar boy who gave me a life lesson I've never forgotten. And I was at St. Athanasius in, in Brooklyn. And at the time I was, in, I was a young priest and he was basically kind of like one of the older guys, one of the older servers. He was kind of like the helper. And he, and I think I may have told the story, but he uh, he met me, and I gave him all these papers and all this other stuff, and we crossed Bay Parkway, which was quite an adventure. <laughs> and then we walk into church, and I'm talking to him. At least I, th- I thought I was talking to him, and I'm halfway down the aisle, and and I had made the comment. I said, you know what? When you get older, you need to become a priest because I need help here. And then I went went down a bit, and all of a sudden, he's not there. <laughs> And I turn around, and there he is at the back of the at the at the head of the uh, middle aisles. I go over and say, "What's the matter?" And he looked at me very seriously, and he goes, "He said, Father, he said, I could never do the work you do, but almost like what the tone is, you do too much work. I don't want to do that." Oh, <laughs> I was going to say it's and, almost the the right. Yeah, and, I thought, and of course I laughed about it, and we, but then I've never forgotten about it because the power of our example, even sometimes giving the example that we don't think we're giving. Yeah, and I was so busy and so hurried that he's saying, "I don't want to live like that." Fascinating, <laughs> huh? I pray he became a priest, though. That's my prayer. That, he's my top candidate yes. for prayer. <laughs> <laughs> and and you haven't slowed down since, by the way. I'm sure. <laughs> no, no, I should, but I, oh, that's another question we're going to get to. I think maybe right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. But first, question number two says, uh, if you could interview anyone from any time for Let Me Be Frank, who would you choose? Oh, now if I answer it, you're going to answer it. Okay. All right, so I'll give you some time for me the number one person I would want to interview is our blessed lady. Wow. Yeah. First of all, I'd be tongue tied. But once I untung the tie or untied the tongue, uh, because could you imagine the things you could ask? Yeah. Like all the hidden years in scripture, what was it like? How, how, I mean, it would just it'd be so fast. Besides the spiritual guidance, besides the intercession, besides all the rest, which is a given. Right. It would be, it, what what an experience that would be. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Who would you interview? Uh, so I think 
the first person that comes to mind is that I would love to, I would have loved to have met John Paul II because I never did. Mm. But I don't think I'm smart enough to have a conversation with him. So I would pick someone like, this is not religious at all, but <laughs> Ernest Shackleton, you know, the, the, the early 1900s <laughs> British explorer who crossed Antarctica on foot. He was really? so fascinating. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. I, I had I, never heard of him. That's, you know, I learned something. It's terrible that that's the first guy that comes to my <laughs> No, 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 not at all. No, it just says a lot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, moving oh. on. <laughs> uh, let's see. Okay, here's here's question number three, Excellency. Uh, mm -hmm. It says, uh, when you're tired and need a break, what do you do to recharge your battery and go forward? Well, so that's that, that is a great question. First, you you also you have I'll, I'll think people. about it too. Yeah, my friends have uh, they know this about me. I quote Mother Mother Cabrini. You know, when she says rest, rest, and she said, "Well, when we die, we eternally rest." So, what's the what's the <laughs> interest in resting now, right? But um, I do a very terrible job of resting. So that's my public confession. Okay, <laughs> I, I I am very much driven in many ways, which is not good, but it is. I, I work on it. it. Ordinarily, like for example, after a long day, I would come after I have dinner, which is usually one of the last things I do. I'll either pick up a book mm -hmm. and read a bit, or watch something on on uh, on television, or um, I like um, BritBox. You know, BBC and the shows of the BBC. Oh, okay. Yeah, because I like mysteries. So they have Agatha Christie and they have Poirot and they have Sherlock Holmes and stuff like that, which I, I very much oh, enjoy. Nice. Right. And then for extended periods of time, it's manual labor. We've talked about that. Yes. I like to work with my hands. Yep. I find that to be, believe it or not, relaxing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, uh, and you? I would say I love uh, playing sports or um, I read a book. I read a lot. Um, Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you, you actually, you know, what's a blast for me is after dinner, the only the, it doesn't happen every night because our, our family is so busy, but when we have dinner together after night, after dinner, if we're able to play a game together, like a, like uh -huh. a card game or a board game, that's a blast. Cause my kids are hilarious. So yeah, <laughs> that's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. We used to, I used to play cards with my father. Nice. And he used to cheat, but I didn't <laughs> let him know it. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, gosh. Okay. Here's question number four, Excellency. What advice would you give to young new bishops just starting? And what about- Run. <laughs> Run. <laughs> yeah, you've said that before. <laughs> no, no, no. D d yeah. And, and uh, I couldn't help myself. No, I mean- uh, Courage. Do what you got to do. Yeah. Be joyful yes. in the fact that you have the opportunity to do things that perhaps others could not do. But I mean, what is what did Padre Pio? What's Padre Pio saying? Uh, right? Pray, pray, hope, don't, don't worry. worry. Yeah, and hope and don't. That, that would be the great advice you could give any anybody who's in a religious vocation. Yeah. What about you? What about radio hosts? What would you say to a radio host? Uh, I would say, at least in the Catholic world. Um, mm -hmm. always remember that it's never about you. And if you do it because you want fame or recognition, you are in trouble. Mm -hmm. and, oh, and it would help you a lot if you team up with a, a holy and talented bishop. <laughs> well, then you lucked out in yes. some sense because you got the bottom of the barrel. <laughs> you got somebody. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right? So there you go. <laughs> All right. This one, this one is um, somewhat related, I think, Excellency. And actually, you've mm -hmm. talked about this uh, a, yes. a couple years ago, but it's great to yes. great to tell the story again. Mm -hmm. It's a multi part question. It says, um, "How do you become bishop? Did you have a clue it was coming, or was it out of the blue? And who was the first person that you told?" Well, backwards. I mean, the first person I told when the pontifical secret was lifted was my mother, of course. And my mother and my mystic friends had already premonitions of this, as I've, I've shared before, my mother. Actually, my mother, since I was a boy, she only told me that much later on. 
My mother had the sense I'd be a priest when I was a little boy. Wow. She never said it to me, <laughs> um, which is, isn't that odd? Like what mothers know. Amazing. Yeah. I, I did have an inkling. Not really. Not really. I mean, why? Why do I say that? Well, simply because I, I'm, I'm not to be foolish about it, but I, I don't fit any category per se. I, I'm kind of like an acquired taste. <laughs> I, I just, I am who I am. So in some sense, um, I take great pride in that because to thine own self be true. And of course, in light of faith, you have to be true to Christ first. But also because the, the, if, you're going to, if you're going to work on behalf of the Lord, just like you said, there should be no ego involved in that. There should be no machination. There should be no strategizing. There shouldn't be any sort of personal ambition. That that gets in the way, then human agency takes over. So I, I've i never done that. I don't want to do that. I'm never going to do that. So did I have a clue? Not really. Yeah. Not really. And you said that the news came to you, if I remember correctly, Excellency, on a phone call. Uh, to become Bishop of Bridgeport, yes. But to become a bishop, no. In those days, uh, b the ordinary Bishop of DiMarzio was told to ask. Oh, okay. And so um, the bishop pulled me into the chapel, closed the door, and I thought, my goodness gracious, and that he asked. Um, and um, he also gave me the option to say no. Oh, wow. Yeah, because he said, if there is anything that I need not know but would disqualify you from the office in your own mind, then say no. Yeah. So, yeah, that was quite a monumental. And then afterwards, I honestly don't remember the rest of the night. <laughs> As I look back, yeah. I, I lived upstairs on the top floor of the mansion where the bishop lives. I don't remember it. I I I, I must have sat dazed in my in my couch because I thought to myself, "Oh my gosh, <laughs> what does this mean?" <laughs> yeah. Wow. So, mm -hmm. okay, this here's a question. Uh, question number six: um, What exactly is a born again Christian? You know, it's funny. I'm not sure if there's an experience explicit definition of a born-again Christian. Certainly it is among our evangelical and Pentecostal brothers and sisters. Right? But generally, I think the best way to, to define it is simply say it is a Christian who's had an experience of a dramatic conversion. And oftentimes it's associated with this idea of accepting the Lordship of Jesus Christ in your life. So you may have been a Christian, lukewarm, not practicing, or perhaps not even a Christian at all. But if you were a Christian by baptism, whatever, and faith made no difference, something happens that dramatically changes your life. And in, in the history of the church, we've had, we'll say Paul's perfect example. I mean, there's so many examples of conversions that literally t take your life and just flip it around. Yes. Yep. Same is true here. Um, so in some sense... We as Catholics understand that to be an ongoing experience of life, that you may have a moment of profound conversion. And therefore, you're not born again to be baptized. Remember, Jesus speaks about being born again in the scriptures, yes. right? Yes, yep. Right? But, but on the other hand, we see conversion as a lifetime process. Right. Of multiple steps getting you to ever more accept the Lordship of Jesus Christ. But that you have to accept the sovereignty of the Lord in your life is true for every disciple. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So with regard to that conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus, then uh, would it be fair to say in a way that anyone who's baptized is born again? Well, we're, we're certainly born into Christ without a doubt. Okay. Because we become the temples of the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. It's almost, you see, that's an interesting question. So there is the objective gift of grace. And there's also on the part of the person, the appropriation of the grace and allowing the grace to change your life. So an infant receives the gift of baptism and the sanctifying grace of the Holy Spirit. But as that infant grows up, like we did, we have to allow that grace to change our lives. So you have to appropriate it in some way. You have to allow it to. So in a sense, there are many people who have not done that mm -hmm. 
and then something happens that boom changes their whole life but what we what we information want is that to gradually transform someone into the image of christ right. don't wait there's, there's no need to wait it's but that that happens um gives hope because it's never too late yes. right for a person to come back to the lord yep okay mm -hmm. great okay so here's the next question uh if you refer to a nun as sister, then why do you call a priest father? Oh, well, let me complicate the question. Let me ask you this question. Did not Jesus in the gospel say, call no one your father? Yeah. Except your father in heaven? Matthew. Yeah. So why do we call priest father? What do you think? I think because, uh, well, he was talking about um, people who... Uh, unnecessarily elevate themselves versus mm -hmm. actual fathers or spiritual fathers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that could be. I mean, I don't think there's the definitive answer to this, to be honest, because I, I was in my research, I wasn't able to find a definitive answer of where that came. But I would say this, the image of the fatherhood of God goes back to the Old Testament. It's not just a revelation of the Lord in the New Testament, right? And when you consider that, then um, there is in some sense for a priest to, to model the fatherhood of God to the people entrusted to his care. So what does a father do? In the sacrament of marriage, a husband and wife, in their love for each other, procreate. So a father is, is an essential piece of the giving of life. And then a father, along with his spouse, right, nurtures that life, protects that life, educates that life, brings that life forward. So in a sense, a priest offering sacrifice in the name of Jesus Christ, entering into the mystery of the death and resurrection of the Lord, the son brings the fatherhood of the father into the world, right? Reflects that. We who are in with Christ, we do the same thing. And how do we do that? Well, we give life. And we nurture life. Mm. We're the instruments of the giving of life. Eucharist, forgiveness of sins. Not that we do it, but we're the conduit for it, right? And then the, the nurturing of life, education, formation, walking with people, in discipleship. So in a sense, it's very apropos yes. of what priestly ministry is. Yes. Yep. Spiritual fatherhood. Yes. Mm -hmm. And and Paul, Paul calls himself that too. When he writes to the Corinthians, he says, For I became your father in Christ. He calls Timothy right. his son, even though he's not his actual right. biological son. Right. Exactly. Yep. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, okay. <laughs> Here's an interesting one. Uh, what was your favorite class in school of all time? Oh, well, that was easy. It was religion. <laughs> but actually, well, as, a st as, as an elementary kid, it was, st it was definitely religion. In high school, you know, it's, that's the real question. It was probably Greek. Wow. You took Greek in high school? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I went to Regis in the city. Right. I was the last class at Regis High School that had Greek for four years. I had Latin for six months, Greek for four years. Wow. Yeah. And it was, I loved it. Huh. I loved it. And Koine Greek was not that difficult. Once you got the the alphabet down and the declensions and all the rest, it was it was really neat hmm. to read the New Testament in Greek. Wow. Now I'm like super rusty. <laughs> That's so cool yeah. though. <laughs> yeah. So that was a bit exotic. Huh. So yeah. Yeah. Nice. So what about you? What was your favorite? My my best subject in school was actually French. Is that right? Yeah, it is. But I had, senior year of high school, I had an AP English class where we analyzed poetry and literature that I just loved. It was such a great class. Wow, so you speak French? I mean, it's it's probably rustier than your Greek. <laughs> yeah. But but isn't it funny when you look back on your life and the things that we were, we were like kind of were enamored of? Yeah. And, and they have a season in our life and then other things you move on to other things right. and then you go back but if you could see it now obviously our listeners can't see it but behind me is the small little manual i had of the new testament in greek oh wow I kept it 
all this. Yeah. And every once in a while, every not often, but every once in a while, I'll go back to the Greek when I'm preparing homilies. And it's, it's, yeah, it's fascinating. So cool. Probably gives you yeah. insights that I can't even imagine. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. cool. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, you know the difference in language and what it conveys, mm -hmm. too. Yes. So for French yes. or Greek, Korean, mm -hmm. and how, it, the, the nuances, the, it, it's just, again, if, if humanity could learn to live with one another in peace, what we could do to enrich each other's lives, which is just astonishing. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Let's see. Next question. Uh, why do popes have to choose a new name when they're elected? And when did that start and why? Well, it started with the first pope, didn't it? Because Jesus changed his name. Right. Yeah. Um, I think it's the whole idea of a new creation, a new identity, a new creation. But there's another thing, too. In the, in the Old Testament, in ancient cultures, to know one's name, to give somebody a name, is to have a hold over them. Mm. Okay? And to have a claim on them. So in some ways, it seems to me that taking on a new name is a new identity. It's a new beginning. It's a new creation. But in a religious context, it's Christ's claim on you for this new life. I no longer call you X, I call you Y, but I am the one who's calling you Y, even though you're making the choice. Right. So it's fascinating, right? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. You know, the other thing too, if I may, just a, you know, confirmation. You have a confirmation name? It's just Stephen. Oh, it's the same as your baptism? Yes. Yeah. See, most people don't realize the right of confirmation does not call for a new name. Oh. It does not. We have the custom of doing it based on this, but actually you can use, as you did, your baptismal name because you're confirming baptism. Mm, right. But the, the idea of a new name is, again, a claim. Christ claims you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And by the way, when we ask that question, what name would you take if you ever became the Pope, which will never happen, people still don't let me forget. <laughs> nice. So we'll let it go. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> All right. I think uh, uh, here's a fun one. <laughs> I can't wait to hear this. Uh, Bishop Frank, have you ever received a traffic ticket? Okay. You answer first. Have you? <laughs> I have received a lot because no, I have, really, a lot, really. Yeah, I drive way too fast, you know, and it's it's not so much because I like speed as much as it is that you know um, I just want to get where I'm going. <laughs> yeah, yeah, press for time. Yeah, yeah, that's true. No, I had one ticket, one moving ticket in my whole life. That's it. Wow, just one. And I tell you the story. The story's a riot. So. I was a priest. I was on Flatbush Avenue in Brooklyn, making a left onto Flatlands. There was a little sign that said, you can't, you know, like the, the circle with the sign and they put the, the, uh, the uh, arrow through the, the line through the arrow that you couldn't make. Yes. Well, I made it <laughs> because it was graffitied. <laughs> Policeman pulls me over. Didn't you see the sign? I said, yes, I couldn't read the sign. He said, nah, take it. Oh my gosh. So I go back to I go back to the rector and say, I'm sorry, but that's unjust. I am not I'm sorry. I what did I know what it said? Yeah. So I go to court, I go to traffic court. And first row, first row, I'm sitting right there, collar the whole thing. <laughs> judge comes in, everybody stands up. Do you swear? Blah, blah, blah. Okay. The judge tells the the officer, call him over. <laughs> me. <laughs> me. So I come up to the bench before before anything starts. He leans over and he says to me, uh, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> I said, Your Honor, I had this thing. In it, and I made the left-hand turn. And it was the sign. But it's, it's, he said, okay, I'm going to hear you first. <laughs> right. So he says, did you blah, blah, blah? I said, yes. And he put his hand over the microphone because they record them. He says, wrong answer. <laughs> <laughs> He said, are there any mitigating? So, yes, of course there were mitigating. It was, it was graffiti. It was this, all the stuff I went through. He said, fine. He 
He said, your fine is $5. Pay it at the door. You're dismissed. Wow. <laughs> and everybody's looking at me as I'm walking out. <laughs> so next time um, I go to traffic court, I need to rent a priest costume. I'll come with you. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I'll be your attorney. <laughs> oh, gosh. I think we have time to squeeze in one more before the break, Excellency. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, let's see. It's a little bit of a story. It says, I was driving my son to school today, and a black cat crossed our path, and I told him it's a sign of bad luck, which obviously makes no sense, and yet still the thought crosses my mind. Do you have any superstitions like knocking on wood, walking under ladders, opening umbrellas in the house, etc.? Well, you know, this caused me to reflect because I don't open an umbrella in the house. Um. Maybe that is a superstition on my part. I really don't know. I've never really, I, I just, right? But it, ordinarily, no, obviously not, because superstition is this this strange attempt to think that you can control the spiritual world somehow by gesture or ritual or whatever. Right. Um, and by the way, as we said many times, there is no luck. Yes. <laughs> yes. There's only grace, right? And the providence of God. But this is not uncommon, Right, True. even among believers. Mm -hmm. So it's it's just a strange way of acknowledging a spiritual world. It's a vain way to try to control the spiritual world. But if it has any value at all, it recognizes that there is a spiritual world right. that we cannot deny. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. Yeah, that's a good way to look at it. Okay, so with that, let's take a break. Uh, we've got a ton more listener questions uh, in the mailbag um, that we can handle on the other side. This is Let Me Be Frank on the Veritas Catholic Network. We'll be right back. If you're concerned about your end-of-life plans, searching for a Catholic cemetery, or have loved ones who are buried in one of the 14 Catholic cemeteries throughout Fairfield County, now might be a good time to begin planning for yourself or for other family members. Call one of our family advisors at 203-742-1450 and select option 5 to leave a message or visit www.ctcemeteries.org. Many people don't realize that they can be buried with their deceased loved ones, even if all of the family's in-ground plots have been taken. The Diocese of Bridgeport Catholic Cemeteries provides in-ground burials, as well as columbarium and mausoleum options. This makes it possible to unite your family together in the same cemetery, and it's an opportunity to build a bridge for your family back to the church. Talking about this issue is not easy, but pre-need planning makes your wishes clear, reduces cost, and helps your family avoid difficult decisions at a time of grief and loss. You can start your planning now by contacting one of our family advisors at 203-742-1450 and select option 5 or visit www.ctcemeteries.org. We can guide you through the options, regulations, and considerations to help you make the best decisions for your family. The number is 203-742-1450 and select option 5 or visit www.ctcemeteries.org. Okay, welcome back to Let Me Be Frank on the Veritas Catholic Network. All right, Excellency, we got a, a bunch more questions here. We, we had, by the way, in the mailbag that I sent you, a hundred questions still, didn't we? Some, yes. Something like that. That was yep. fantastic. Yep. Keep sending them mm -hmm. in if you're listening. Okay, mm -hmm. here we go. Can you explain the difference between a diocesan priest and one from a specific order, like Holy Cross, Jesuit, Dominican? What makes one decide which type of priest to become? Does the daily work differ greatly if they're in an order versus a diocesan priest? Well, this, uh, these are a lot of good questions, and they, and they roll up into the fundamental difference between a vocation to diocesan priesthood and a vocation to a religious congregation. So that's the fundamental difference. A person, first of all, the person, call, the person is called, so don't really decide in that sense. Right? Right. You discern. And the call to religious life is, is not a generic call. It's a specific call to a specific charism that a specific congregation embodies, right? So you're called to the spirit of St. Francis and the charism of hospitality, right? 
and you enter into the Franciscans. You feel called to become a Franciscan or the Dominicans, which would be much more of an academic preaching the word of God and a tremendous love for the word of God. You may feel this call to, to enter into the Dominican charism. Right? So diocesan priesthood is a call to ministry to serve God's people. So they're different in that sense. Now, if you have a call to a Franciscan life, say, it's not necessarily a call to priesthood. Then there's a second discernment because you could be a brother for your whole life and not a priest. Okay. Right? So, so it's the charism on one hand and the, the call to the Asim priesthood is, is much, in my mind at least, it's much more a call to dedicate, dedicate one's life in service of God's people, particularly in the pastoral world of the church, the pastoral right. life of the church. I mean, when I was growing up, I was I was fascinated with the Dominicans because I had Dominican sisters. Uh, I was very much enamored of Jesuits because I had them in high school and their charism. And of course, religious congregations tend to live in larger communities. They live fraternity together, but they also have the evangelical councils, poverty, chastity, and obedience, and all the rest. But in the end, it really was to 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 kind of be a father of a, of a community to, to serve a people is what ultimately really interested me hmm. Yeah, from the outside. And then gradually discerning, you know, my story discerning from the inside when I, you know, stopped being so, so stubborn, <laughs> right. What the Lord was calling me to. Mm -hmm. Do you ever hear that joke excellency about the woman who goes to her um, bishop and says that you know, my son's very interested in becoming a priest, um, but what's the difference between the orders and what do you think he should do? And the bishop says, well, if he's going to make a diocesan priest, it'll take about eight years of study. And if he's going to be a Dominican, it'll take about uh, 10 years. And if he wants to be a Jesuit, it'll take like 14 years of studying. And the woman thinks for a second, she goes, yeah, then he better become a Jesuit because he's a little slow. <laughs> Good old mom. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question. Oh, this is a great question. I actually was going to ask you this question at one point too. Uh, mm -hmm. What do we do with religious articles or those that we need to get rid of for whatever reason, like crosses, statues, Bibles, even I'll right. throw in like blessed blessed prayer cards or something like that. Right, right. You know, it's, it's an interesting. We, we, it's, it's a question many people ask. We just had a collection among the parishes, for the pastors, for the sacramentaries, the missals, the old lectionaries, the old ritual rites of the sacraments, to collect them all. Hmm. Because they accumulate, and the pastors have the same question, well, like, what do I do here? And the answer to the question lies, you have one of two options. Bury it or burn it. Because they're blessed. Okay. So what we did for the parishes, for the pastors, is we brought them to the cemeteries and they buried them. Right? Now, for the average person, it becomes a bit of a problem because you may not have the land to, bur to bury it. You, um, like certainly when I lived in Brooklyn, where, where were we going to bury it? On the sidewalk. <laughs> <laughs> and to burn it, uh, you have to do that very gingerly. And, and, and it... The sensibilities, I mean, to see prayer cards burning, it, 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 it's, right. do you know what I mean? Yes. It evokes feelings. Yes. And, so if at all possible, the way to dispose of them is to go to a place where there is enough ability to bury them okay. would, be, would be my preferred answer. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, and uh, for the next question, um, what's your favorite snack food? Oh, no, you go first. <laughs> You go first. Uh, let's see. I guess I would have to choose French fries. I love French fries. Oh, <laughs> the ultimate comfort food. <laughs> okay, but I don't consider that. I consider that to be like a meal. That's not really a snack in my definition. A snack is like 100% unhealthy for you, <laughs> not just like semi-unhealthy for you. And for me, anyone who knows me, they know the answer to this question. Okay. It is the ultimate snack food ever created, and its name is Oreos. 
in nice. any shape. Now they have in any shape. But now for Christmas, I got as a gift, believe it or not, fudge covered Oreos. Wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I always cry. <laughs> yeah. 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 And that's why I will not go on the scale. It's just <laughs> the damage that was done was just horrific. <laughs> that's tremendous. <laughs> <laughs> okay all right um let's see next question uh why do priests wash their hands during mass is it holy mm -hmm. water and what do you do with the water used for the washing mm -hmm. so it is not holy water it's, so it's regular water that's disposed of normally and all right so let's go back to the old testament the, the ritual washings right the purifications, even the purification of Our Lady, for example, right? Uh, and the Feast of the Purification. And um, Jesus spoke of the purifications, right? And he criticized many of them simply because they were empty ritual that did not do what they were supposed to do. Hmm. So what are they supposed to do? They are supposed to remind the individual of the need for both their purification spiritually as well as readying themselves for the sacrifice at hand. So priests wash their hands at mass. And he says, wash away my iniquity, cleanse me from my sins. So there is a, a proximate preparation to clean your hands before you actually touch the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. And a reminder of your own unworthiness and the need for spiritual purification. In both senses, it is the cleansing. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Right. And, and and then and you do it right before in during mass. The priest will do it right before the he goes to the uh, prayer over over the gifts before he begins the preface to the Eucharistic prayer. Right. Yep. Right. Now, of course, one other thing too, to just for us, it's symbolic. The cleansing of hands. One would assume your hands are clean that you've washed them before you start to go out. But could you imagine in the Middle Ages? where the cathedrals had animals in them and cows and sheep in the back and incense to cover over the smell and people would not have bathed often, if at all, right. including the priest. Right. So there, there was a real need to clean your hands. Yes. <laughs> right? I saw your face. Too bad nobody in the podcast could see your face. <laughs> I was describing that. <laughs> it doesn't sound good. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Uh, all right. Here's a great question. Um, we are followers and believers, believers in Jesus Christ. And we believe that we are the one true religion. And though we fall under the umbrella of Christians, why do we then call ourselves Catholics as an, as an analogy, we call ourselves Americans, not, uh, North Americans or United Staters, even though there are Canadians, Mexicans, uh, and other South and American other South countries. Americans. Well, well, now this is very interesting too. Um, what do we think those who live in other countries in the Americas? What do you think they think? What well, we call ourselves Americans? This, this is an interesting question. Again, yeah, talk about culture and perspective. Right. They are Americans too, yeah. aren't they? <laughs> so I've always found that to be a bit odd. Yeah, right? I wonder. Huh. Yeah. Yeah, it, it gives, we understand what we mean, but for them, it could almost sound as if like there's a superiority. Well, they're the Americans, so what do we, <laughs> right? But we don't mean it that way, but we always have to be sensitive how other people hear us, yes. right? But anyway, that's not the point. The point is here. History answers the question. There was one holy Catholic and apostolic church. There was one church until 1054 when we split with the East. In the Reformation, we split from the Protestants, and then they've been splitting ever since. All right. So in the creed, we say it was one holy Catholic and apostolic church. So we were Catholic as an adjective of the church. Now, it is a Greek word. Kat holos. Throughout the whole is what it means. Mm. So Catholic means it is throughout the whole. That which is throughout the whole, whole world, whole faith, all people, everywhere, universal. Because the church is 
the forebearer of the kingdom of God. It's the mystical body of Christ. Right? But we call ourselves Catholic in response to the divisions. So it's hearkening back to the four signs of the church. We call ourselves Catholic because we are part of the original church from the founding of the apostles without any breaks. And our Christian brothers and sisters are related to us almost um, as siblings or offspring, depending, right? So we call ourselves Catholic to make that distinction. But in fact, we are Christians. We are all Christians. But the Catholic Church are, is where the original Christian church is still to this day in existence. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. That's great. And, yeah. And, and speaking of, of names and what to call ourselves, the next question is, uh, did Jesus have a last name? Oh, see now. Okay. So let me go back to my youth to try to answer this question. I remember when I was a boy and I would be sit, sitting at these dinners with my aunts and uncles and, you know, the whole gang. And my mother and my aunts would be talking about Cajanese history. That is the history that went on in the little village where they grew up. Almost all of them grew up in the same village. And they had this very odd saying. They would say, Giuseppe, Fu Franco, Fu Antonio, Fu whomever. And I'm thinking myself, who is this Fu? <laughs> who is this Fu? <laughs> and of course, it's the past, right? Who was of. Ah. So they identified a person, right? Even though they did have last names, they identified the person by the lineage of their father. So yeah. if Frank, whose father was Joseph, whose father was John, whose father, then you eventually knew exactly who you were talking about. Mm. That's how they spoke about him. Wow. They didn't say uh, Frank uh, Smith. Right. Now, go back to the Old Testament. All right. The word bar, B-A-R. Mm -hmm. Right. It's the same idea. So in Jesus's time... Jesus more than likely would have been known as Jesus bar Joseph. Right. Because they would have known, well, the Jesus who has Joseph as what they would have perceived to be his father, not necessarily knowing that it was his foster father, they would have identified Jesus. So, so the answer is no, he did not have a last name like we would. Right. But that's how they referred to each other to make sure you knew exactly who, to, who you were talking about. Yeah. Is that fascinating? Yeah, that's so interesting. That's so interesting. Right. And so what do we do in the 21st century? 21st century, we say, ooh, we have um, Ancestry, whatever is it? Right, uh, yeah, dot .com or whatever. And, dot .com and, and, and genealogies. But it, that was common. Yeah. You, 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 there was the oral tradition of the genealogy of people that could go back three, four, five generations. It's fascinating. It's just fascinating what, how times have changed, what we have lost and what we're trying to regain in different ways now. Yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Here's a, here's a question. The next one says, um, how many people in the New Testament are said to have seen the risen Jesus? Well, who was, who was the first to see the risen Jesus? Scripturally, it was Mary Magdalene. Mm -hmm. I like what you've said in the past where you said you like to imagine that it was his mother, Mary, first. Mm-hmm. Also, Peter is the first of the apostles right. to see Jesus, right? So the answer of how many people, Mary Magdalene, Peter, the apostles, certainly Thomas, when he entered into the room, and doesn't it say in sacred scripture that he appeared to 5,000? Yes. So he appeared to a good number right. is the answer to the question, a good number, right? Yeah. And did all 5,000 come to faith because they saw Jesus? Probably not. They probably said this could be an elaborate hoax. Yeah, yeah. Does not, where is it in the, uh, with the story of Lazarus in the bosom of Abraham, you know, send them to my brothers, even if someone should rise from the dead. Yes. They may not believe it. Right. Yep. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, let's see. Besides St. Peter, who do you think was the greatest, most important, or most influential pope? <laughs> okay. 
you answer that question first, <laughs> my friend. <laughs> in my life personally, the greatest, most influential per- pope to me personally was John Paul II because he was the the pope of most of my life. He's the pope that I grew up under. So yeah, yeah. I I I, I I'm not sure I can answer the question. I'm not sure there is a single one that I think is the greatest. Certainly the ones we call the great are great for a reason. So Leo the Great, Gregory the Great. Now a lot of more and more people are proclaiming John Paul the Great. The, it's, I don't think, the, outside of Peter, I'm not exactly sure there is one, right? Right. Above all others. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, those ones that were called the great, I mean, they really were great. <laughs> yeah, and they always in times of great challenge. Right. But that's not necessarily to take away from Pius the Twelfth or you know somebody else. Well, well, it, it certainly we had all right. So when you look at the uh, at the papacy, which we did, we got all the way up to the Middle Ages when we did it. Yes, I mean there are some characters <laughs> right. who should never have been the pope. So obviously they're they're not in the running. <laughs> right, right, okay? right, exactly. They're not in the running. But let me ask you something. Given the age. I've always believed, and I believe with all my heart, that whoever's called to leadership of the church is called by the grace of the Holy Spirit because he meets the needs of the church at that moment. Yes. So sometimes quiet, unassuming perseverance is as great as someone like Leo in his tome and settling the Christological controversy, or Gregory kicking a tiller and negotiating with Tiller the Hun not to sack Rome, or John Paul staring down the communists when he went back to Poland, and so many other things that people have done in extraordinary ways. Sometimes quite perseverance is as great, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Because that's what the church needed at the moment. Yes. Yes. And I would think it'd be uh, it'd be difficult to really adequately in most cases, um, analyze a pontificate until after. Way after. Yeah. Way after. I didn't mean way, way after. Almost, Steve, and people may disagree with me for saying this, but only when everyone who was alive when he was Pope is dead. Hmm. That long. So you, we won't understand John Paul's real influence on the church for, I would think, another 60 or 70 years. Wow. Yeah. Right. That's 100 years after he he may have died. Yeah. Hmm. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, uh, here's one. By the way, yes. by the way, if I may just interject, because uh, and, and not to go off too far, because I think I mentioned this once before. It, the In the secular world, the parallel are the greatness of our presidents. Like who in the end is really considered to be great is only known after the passage of time. Right. And Abraham Lincoln's the perfect example because when he died, he was judged to be a failure. And now he's considered the greatest president we've ever had. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So it's the same thing in this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, let's see. Next question. How does one get to be a cardinal? Well, it's a direct appointment by the Pope, right? So uh, uh, to be honest, I'm not exactly sure how that happens. I I presume there are recommendations given to the Pope. I presume he may ask the nuncios of the world for nominations and suggestions. It could be that he has personal dealings and relationships with individuals, with men who are bishops or archbishops and is impressed by them. Um, Francis has altered the practice insofar as, remember, the cardinals, all right, are affiliated with the See of Rome. They are the voters in the conclave. They are the closest advisors to the Pope. And for a long time, they lived in Rome. In more modern times, they live all around the world. And there were sees, archdioceses, that traditionally had cardinals for a very long time. So sometimes the appointment to the see was also implicitly an indication that you would become a cardinal, Mm -hmm. right? Now that has changed with Francis. Right. 
And even before Francis had changed, so for example, St. Louis had a cardinal for a number of generations, no more. Detroit, no more. Archbishop Japu was not made a cardinal. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. So in Philadelphia, yeah. and then other sees have arisen. So yeah. uh, to, to, the, the honest answer to the question is I'm not exactly sure, but I think it's a combination of many factors to have names and resumes before the Pope, and then the Pope ultimately chooses who he considers to be those that he would want to be his closest collaborators. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. Other th other than the ability to vote for the next Pope, is it is it largely an honorific title? Well, yeah, in a sense, but also there are some other duties and responsibilities because remember the cardinals sit on the uh, on the congregations, mm. the the so that they give direction to certain of the dicasteries. Right now, it's not just cardinals, but they still have a predominant presence among the cardinals. Yes. So, it you influence policy, you influence the decision making of the dicasteries. Um, you offer advice to the pope. Now there's a council of cardinals, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, however, there are nine of them yep. that meet with the Pope four times a year. So I think it's more than ceremonial. Okay. It's evolved into more than ceremonial. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have two more that we can crank through here. Uh, let's see. Mm -hmm. Have you ever offered a mass where either a kid was running up and down the aisle or someone was uncontrollably coughing or doing something that kept breaking your concentration and you asked them to please stop or go outside? Never. Never. I would never do that. And let me tell you why. First of all, because I can imagine my mother coming into the pulpit and slapping me <laughs> in the face if I did it. For one. But prescinding for my for my own self preservation, the truth is, if we sat at our, our family table and a child began to cry, would you expel them from the table? Right. Yeah. Now I understand it's a sacrament, I understand it's a moment of great consecration and holiness. But they are the children of God. Yes. They are the children of the Lord. How could we say you're not welcome here? You presume on the goodwill and the common sense of parents yeah. right, to be able to do their best. But even after they do their best, some kids just become uncontrollable. And in my experience, if they really get uncontrollable, parents voluntarily leave, calm them down and come back. Yeah. Why would they need me to say anything? And if I lose my concentration because somebody's got little babies crying, then obviously I'm not concentrating. <laughs> right. <laughs> yep. <laughs> And they're kids. It's the sounds of life. Exactly. It's beautiful. Sure. Sure. Okay. Last question, Excellency. It says on October first, twenty twenty-three. Ooh, this is uh, this person's very observant. <laughs> October first, twenty twenty-three. Wow. Wait a minute. Where were you on the Isn't night? Isn't that fun? No, no. That's eleven days after I was installed. Oh no. No, twenty twenty-three. That's ten years. That's ten. That's ten years and eleven days. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. You mentioned in your sermon a story mm -hmm. of working for McGraw Hill and dealing with a woman who refused to look or talk to you until the last day when she when you mentioned that you were going to study to be a priest. And then the mm -hmm. floodgates opened. Have you ever seen that person since that time? No. I have not. I often wonder. Sometimes she's she's actually in my prayers. I do not know. Hmm. But it was a life lesson. You know, you have those moments in life that just you never forget. That was one that I will never forget. Wow. And the power of grace. Yeah. I, yeah. No, I, I wonder. Yeah. And the power of the priesthood, actually, too. Right, Excellency? Even though you weren't a priest, the fact that mm -hmm. you were going to do that, I guess. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. We talked about a born-again Christian. The name of Jesus has the power to break in to every moment if we unleash its power. Right. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I will now. I, you know what? I will remember her in prayer. This was a a, a, a moment of not luck, coincidence, grace to pray. Awesome. Yep. Okay. So we'll uh, take our final break and come back with my question for you, Excellency. This yes. is this is let me be frank on the Veritas Catholic Network. Be right back. Hey, this is Matt Sparazza from The Tangent. Each week on The Tangent, my co-host, Father Sam Kachuba, and I go on tangents to show how intertwined the Catholic faith and our culture really are. With guests like Scott Hahn, Dr. Greg Pitaro, Kristalina Everett, and so many more, 
The Tangent is always entertaining and informative. Check us out on Fridays at 12.30 on 103.9 FM, 1350 AM, anytime on the Veritas app, or wherever you get your podcasts. God bless. Okay, welcome back to Let Me Be Frank on the Veritas Catholic Network. All right, Excellency, as I like to do, I take uh, the privilege, host privilege, to um, ask my own question at the end of the mailbag question. Mm -hmm. So here's what I have to ask you today. Mm Mm-hmm. Because I know that you uh, you you are you studied patristics and that was your yes. your specialty. Yes. So so this is this is why I'm asking who is your favorite of the post apostolic church fathers, and what about him makes him your favorite? Saint Cyril of Alexandria, hmm. because I wrote my dissertation on him. We spent three years together in the library. He <laughs> was a man with flaws, which gives me hope. Um, but he was fiercely, fiercely de- a defender of the unity of the divinity and humanity of Christ. Mm. So he is the father of the hypostatic union. And quite frankly, if there was no hypostatic union, then there is no salvation for us. Because in the end, the, that which comes from divinity is given to the humanity of Christ and the humanity of Christ through the Holy Spirit, the grace of that comes to us. And through that, we have forgiveness of sins. But he, he is by far, now of course, I'm sure there are other fathers equally great, but I, I don't know them as well as I know St. Cyril. So right. I would say he's my favorite. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to do some more homework on him. <clears throat> mm-hmm. All right. So keep those questions coming in for the show. Uh, you can send them in on social media or you can email questions at veritascatholic.com. Bishop Frank Caggiano is on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and so is Veritas Catholic Network. And a big thank you, as always, to our sponsor, Foundations in Faith. A grant from the St. Therese Fund for Evangelization makes it possible for us to bring Let Me Be Frank to you. Foundations in Faith is committed to supporting and transforming pastoral ministries in the Diocese of Bridgeport, and you can learn more about their outstanding work at foundationsinfaith.org. Great to be with you, Steve. Excellency, likewise. And... I would love to ask for your blessing before we all go. Of course. Sure. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, send send forth your Spirit upon us. Help us to be faithful and courageous witnesses. Bring new life and renewal to our church. And bring the spirit of conversion to our world. For we ask this. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, my friend, we're we're creeping closer to Lent. Oh, boy. Isn't that scary? (laughs) I don't believe it. (laughs) It's great. (laughs) Yeah, in a couple weeks. Yes. So we have much to talk about. Thanks, Excellency. Be well.